recording in the other room, so excuse the, uh, the lameness. Uh, we will be um, studying tonight on something that I have actually avoided my entire teaching career. <laughs> and the reason why is because there's a lot of weird things associated with this. And Marriage. so, <laughs> <laughs> no, that in itself is weird. <laughs> Anyways, um, and so I just kind of, eh. you know, a as a teacher, sometimes you, there's just some things that eh, you just like, I'll just teach on something else. Uh, this, the, 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 my, my two most avoided topics in all the Bible, uh, spiritual warfare and the end times. <laughs> I just, I don't know, there's so many people who teach so many strange things, I'm just like, why waste the time? But we'll be reading out of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And then we'll be going through 20. If there are any questions as we go along, uh, just raise your hand or something so I can see, and I will um, do my best to answer. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers um, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, um, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me, and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that, in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, this is kind of a, a two-lesson a two deal, and so this week we're going to talk about just the basics of spiritual warfare. Then the next time um, I teach on this, we'll talk about um, with the cult and with the demonic stuff and that kind of stuff. We'll look at Ouija boards and, and that kind of stuff, just kind of seeing, okay, so what does the Bible actually say about these things? Um, so let's get started. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, we, uh, we had a massive mice infestation uh, in my, my property. Um, we caught... Uh, 40? Somewhere around 40 mice. Wow. And uh, <laughs> massive infestation. And here's the thing, when it first started going, I was like, well, this is irritating. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound weird here, but I, I kind of want to downplay spiritual things, spiritual lessons and things, and I think that that's kind of a, a mistake of mine. Um, because as, as this was going on, and when it first started, I really felt like God was saying, now pay attention because this is the enemy attacking you. And I was like, mice? Mice? But mice? And, uh, and uh, then I just really, I really felt very com and I'm confident, and I'm, I'm still very confident about this, that um, Satan will use things like mice to distract us from other things. You know what I mean? And... Uh, Oftentimes you just kind of downplay the role of Satan as, as our adversary. And so I kind of want to find a balance between views here. And one of the things that I really want you guys to remember as we're looking at this is remember that the Bible says that Satan is like a, is like, he's like a lion. And he, he's just looking for who he can devour. He's just waiting. He comes, he comes for the purpose of killing, stealing, and destroying is what Jesus said. So I, you know, I think that we ought to, we ought to give that due attention and... Uh, so some of you might say, oh, well, if that's all, all the attack of the enemy, if that's all that's involved in spiritual warfare, that's not so bad. But let me kind of give you a little more here. Uh, when you're in your fights with your families, when, uh, when you have bad attitudes towards someone, when you're struggling with an addiction, when, uh, when you're struggling with a disease or in your body or a death of your loved one, um, or when you're struggling with finances, 
These are the ways that oftentimes that Satan will come by and try to distract you. You know what I mean? Now I'm not saying everything bad that happens is a result of Satan. Like pastors talk about this morning, you know, where we get ourselves into a bad situation, it's like, why God? Why me? So I, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that Satan, you know how God uses anything for his good? He, he works it out with all. That's what Satan does in opposite. He just looks for something that he can he can use to destroy us. He doesn't care how stupid it is. If it's something that bothers you, it's something that he'll use. It's that simple. If it's something that bothers you, it doesn't matter how stupid it is. Mice? Yes, mice. God, Satan, not God, Satan will use anything to try and destroy us. Because he doesn't want us to be happy in life. He doesn't want us to be joyful in the spirit. He doesn't want us to be used in the gifts of the spirit. He doesn't want us to be used in evangelism and those kinds of stuff. He, he doesn't want those kinds of things. He wants us to feel comfortable and just coast. That's what he wants us to do. Um, so anyways, um, so there's three things that I specifically want to want to look at with spiritual warfare. The first thing, you don't have to cast demons out of everything. When uh, when the mice, when I was having the thing with the mice, it, you know, I didn't have to cast the demon of the mouse out or something. You, you understand that now? I, I, people get weird with spiritual things. So I, I, I know this might sound like I'm joking, but I am. I'm actually being serious here. You don't have to say, "Lord, th this is this is a this is an evil an evil spirit. If you cast it out of my household." Well, the idea is that there won't be a, a, an evil presence in your household if you don't let an evil presence in your household. We'll talk about this next time. But did you know that Christians can get physically harmed from the demonic the demonic world? There are document, well documented cases of Christians who are messing around with Ouija boards, for instance, they got punched in the gut. The actual bruise on their stomach. Now, I'm not trying to sound weird here, but there is definitely, um, Satan definitely does have power, and he definitely does use that power to try and destroy us and oppose anything that God wants to do. But, you know, the bringing up the men's center again, why do we face so much opposition with men's center? Because Satan doesn't want people out of drugs. It's not that complicated of a process there. He wants people feeling like they're, they're never going to be good enough for God. He wants people feeling like they're, they're, they're just doesn't matter, out, outcasts of society. Satan's happy with that. You know? So why would we face such a hard time with the men's center? Because we want to help people that Satan doesn't want helped. It's that simple. Um, so, you know, when, when I'm praying about this stuff, remember a few things. I always heard growing up in the church that the man's the provider and the protector of the household, right? <laughs> Wrong. The Bible says abundantly clear that God is the protector and the provider of the household. Yeah. And so what has happened is we've placed ourselves in God's position instead of trusting in God for those things. See what I mean? And so then if we, as, as the father, as the husband, lose our job or something, it's, it's something we take personally because we have failed at our job rather than seeking God for a new job. See what I mean? Yes, God does want us to do you know, those things to protect our family and whatnot, but ultimately we need to realize that God is the one who is in charge of our family. You know? And that gets very, very hard when you, you deal with stuff like the loss of, of, of a child, um, stuff like that. You know, oftentimes you can, you can take it personally or you can um, kind of become embittered towards God, not realizing that God is the master and he is and he takes away and we don't have to know all the reasons why things happen and why they don't happen. We just have to trust God through those times of those confusing things happening. Um, to kind of a different idea there. So, you know, when I when, when the thing when when God impressed on my heart about that with the mice, this is this is what I prayed. Lord, I pray that you would protect us. I pray that you would help me to not get distracted. I didn't pray that you would uh, you know, cast the demons out of my yard, you would put a hedge of protection, whatever that means. I never understood that one. Are they talking about like literal hedge, like a plant? It's a joke, just a joke. Um, you know, because the idea is, we're, we, when in spiritual warfare, we have to remember that, that God is the one with the authority, and we pray under that authority. Does that make sense? And I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about here in a minute. It's hard to find a, a because there's some people who think that spiritual warfare isn't a thing. And there's other people who just take it to the weird extreme. 
And so I'm trying to find that balance in between. And so if this gets confusing, please stop me and let me explain differently. The second thing is that casting out demons is only for demonic possession. The only time in script that scripture shows us casting out demons from something is when it is a demonic possession. That's the only situation in scripture that it shows us that. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to be careful with, with, with seeing demons and everything. You know, pastor was talking about a couple Wednesday nights ago with the discerning of spirits. What people have turned that into is where you can tell what kind of a spirit somebody is of and you can cast that spirit out of them. Well, that's not what he's talking about at all. <laughs> if you're curious about that, you can talk to pastor or go, just go back on the Wednesday nights. That, that, uh, there was probably about three weeks ago, I guess. I mean, he probably didn't know. But anyways... Um, and so that's really the only time, and the only situation in the Bible where it talks about binding something. I know this one's real popular. Binding something in the name of Jesus is, is, is real popular. But the only co uh, context of the Bible where it says to bind something is where it's talking about church discipline. And it says that when the elders of the church are, are dealing with someone in, in, in a church discipline situation, that what they bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. In other words... They speak with the authority of heaven in bringing about church discipline. That's what he's talking about there. Not in any way talking about praying, praying against strongholds, anything like that. So I, I, once again, I think that we've kind of taken things out of context and just kind of let the, the, the pagan ideas of our culture kind of get into the church. And then we kind of misuse scripture to fit that context. But in order to, excuse me, in order to fight that, we kind of have to look back 2,000 years and say, okay, what was the context that that was actually written in? And then, you know, did you know that they had witchcraft and that kind of stuff back then too? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You see what I mean? So we, we can't look at it with modern eyes. Um, and then the third thing to remember in all this is that people are not your enemies. People are not gonna. What? People are not your enemies. Thank right. God. People are kind of like. Don't take this the wrong way, okay? People are kind of like. Let me say this a different way. Let's liken this in the situation of the mice, okay? The mice would be representative of the heresies of the bad attitudes that people oftentimes carry. Did you know that the mice were not intentionally attacking my household and my well-being? Did you know that? They're, they're animals. Satan was using it to do that. In the same way, Satan uses people, especially with poor theology, to bring about destruction in the church. Yes. Does that kind of make sense? People are not the enemy. Mm -hmm. The people who oppose us at the men's center, they're not our enemies either. Yeah, Satan right. saw an opportunity to tear us down from doing the work that God put us here to do. Mm -hmm. And so he simply used the opportunity that was there in having them discourage us. Mm -hmm. They were never our enemies. And I think that this is extremely important when we're talking about spiritual warfare. We don't cast out people. We don't get tired of dealing with people. We don't have righteous anger towards people and so just yell at them. It, it, we are going to get mad in life, but our anger does not justify our sinning against a brother or a sister. Does that make sense? Yes. Just because they genuinely did something that was wrong doesn't mean that I have a right to do something out of anger. Does that kind of make sense? God didn't say, okay, well, they messed up, so now you can shoot off your mouth and say something stupid. Now you can gossip because they did that. Now you can, no, 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 that's not how that works. Do you kind of get what I'm saying here? People are not the enemy. We don't need to oppose people, right? We don't need to cast people out of things. Um, even in light of Satan using them to tempt us to sin, they are still not the enemy. Someone, so when someone hurts your feelings, you don't accept yourself. I'm sorry, these are different examples. When someone hurts your feelings, for instance, comma, <laughs> uh, when you don't accept yourself. How many, how many of you guys have, have tried to start exercising and about day three, this thought comes into your head, I'm worthless. And you just kind of go with it. Yeah, I am worthless. I'm never going to be able to do this. See, what Satan does is he puts little little feelers out. And then if he finds a receptive heart that accepts that little thing that he said, he just keeps saying stuff. Like he'll say something like, you're worthless. And then you can either take the bait, I am worthless. And Satan will keep on feeding that. Or you can resist it with scripture, like Jesus did. See what I mean? Yeah. Well, how do I know if it's Satan? Is it a, is it a destructive mindset? Satan comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. 
Is it something that justifies bad attitude towards someone else, or something that says, hey, gossip about this person? Mm. Satan comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's his purpose there, and he will use anything. It, you know, God searches our hearts, but Satan watches. And Satan can kind of see things. Like, he can see how you respond to different situations and say, ah, that person's prideful. Ah, that person has a problem with lust. Oh, that problem, see what I mean? And so he knows how to tempt you with stuff because he's been doing it your whole life. He, he's been watching you as, you as you've been growing, so he knows what kind of stuff to tear you down with. So anytime that you're doing something good, um, I, when I was getting out of porn, uh, it's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no reason in fighting I'm ever going to get out of this. Well, do you honestly think that was God telling you that? No, that was Satan. Why? Because he didn't want me out of porn. You see how that works? Because as long as... So then I start getting out of it, and then I start having, getting depression. Well, God, I'm doing the right thing here. That's how Satan works. And he watches us, and when we're down, then he's going to attack. See how that, do you kind of get what I'm saying here? So, uh, but people are not the enemy. No. When you face depression anxiety, when you hate someone, these are attacks from the enemy. And Satan trying his very best to tear you down and to put more problems into the... Are you... Are you I just have a comment. Go ahead. Yeah. People are not your enemy, just to add. Go ahead. Bit, um, real quick. Uh, people, sometimes like the mice, are... their weak minds and, and unbelieving hearts, and, and they're very intellectual to be used by the enemy. Yeah. Uh, and, and who are he going to use these people against? You and I. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we get mad at them, yeah. we get on their level and start to uh, scuffle around, we're, we're just having a heyday with uh, entertainment. And yeah. And you know, necessary. it's funny that you say that because we're, we're going to talk about that in part two. Um, <coughs> absolutely, yes. I really wish we had more time to look at that too because that's just such a great point, Joe. Um, oh, so many things that, that I want to say. It's like, no, stay on course. <laughs> yeah, you guys ever seen that? Oh, geez. I think it was the. Episode Star Wars episode four. Uh, and what's his what's his name? Dag or whatever. And he's like, stay on target, <laughs> stay on target. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about or no? Yeah. Star Wars is a classic. You guys need to see. Come on. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> so these are attacks. Are attacks, attacks are from the enemy, definitely, absolutely. And we need to start realizing that Satan is opposing us. You know what I mean? We need to not be so naive in this world. And we need to remember that prayer is one of our greatest weapons in spiritual warfare. We need to remember this because these are important things. If, if, if we neglect, just a second, Sandy, if we neglect to acknowledge the truth of what is happening, we are going to be the ones who have to suffer for that. See what I mean? Satan is still going to attack you either way. The difference is, whether are you going to be prepared or are you not going to be prepared? What are you going to say, Sandy? So then, according to Ephesians 6.10 here, so how, how do we stand firm in this? Because he talks about, so stand firm. Okay, so how do we do that? Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation. Now, in this passage, he compares these things to armor. It's important to note that there is not actually a, a set of armor that we are putting on. This is a, a an allegory, is what it's called, um, a metaphor. Uh, and, and why this is important is because Ephesus was kind of a big city, and they would have seen Roman soldiers... Quite frequently, and so what he does is he compares these virtues to things that we need to an armor. 
And if you notice, the only thing that is an offensive weapon of the thing that he says is the word of the Spirit, which is which he's talking about with, with prayer. Now let's go through it again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So in the strength of what? His might. That's the first step to, to spiritual warfare. His might. In the Bible, how many times does it say that God is the warrior? It's right up there with saying all the time that God is the provider and the protector, right? We need to remember what the Bible says, not what our culture has told us. 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities. We don't, we're not fighting against people. And remember, this is Paul writing, the one who's been stoned by people. The one who's been, been ignored and mistreated by people. I'm not fighting people here, guys. We're fighting against this world that we don't even see. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day, and having uh, do all to stand firm. Now this is a reference to a battle tactic that the Romans used. Um, they would pretty, I mean, it's, it's not that complicated a concept. They would all stand next to each other with their shields in front of them and over them. They were known to be virtually impregnable. How? By standing firm. So what is Paul saying here? Stand firm together. Now, it's increasingly important that he didn't necessarily say together, but the idea is definitely implied. Do you know what you call a single Roman soldier by himself? Vulnerable. Do you know what you call a slew of Roman soldiers together fighting in formation? Impregnable. <laughs> so obviously, I mean, let's just get that out there. This is an implied here. I just want to... But anyways, uh, take up the whole mark of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. When there is nothing else you can do, we'll just keep on hanging on. Verse 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Once again, don't read too far into these things. He's just helping us to see the importance of these things. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Have you guys ever seen a Roman Roman shield? It's a pretty good size. It's about yay big, about probably about like that that wide. A very good sized uh, shield. Um, and they were actually known for withstanding fiery darts. In other words, people would get their uh, would light their, their their arrows on fire and would shoot them, and the shield would be able to withstand them perfectly fine. They were actually very durable um, shields. The Romans had a lot of technology that we still haven't even figured out. Um, they had this secret fire that we have never been able to figure out. Really cool stuff. Romans really were advanced for their time. But anyways, um, I'm getting off topic here. Um, where am I at here? Okay, so these things here which are like the, the Roman soldier's armor. And they definitely do protect us from those things. Okay? So, so far, what has he told us how to stand firm with spiritual warfare? Truth. Righteousness. Do the right thing and be an honest person. Peace. Faith, trust in God, and salvation. Did you know you can't stand firm if you're not saved? We're going to talk about this next time, but you cannot be demonically possessed if you are a Christian. You can't be demonically attacked if you are a Christian. That varies once again. We'll talk about that next time. I'm really trying to stay on course here. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. See, did you notice how I said that? The, 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 spirit, the, the word of God and prayer were almost like the same thing. Did you see that? The sword, uh, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying, the natural effect of that, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. So keep on praying. Keep on praying for other people. And keep on praying. In summation of what that's saying there. So, that is how we stand firm against, um, against spiritual warfare. Okay? Basically, to say it easier, do godly things and pray and read your Bible. That's a very simple way of saying what he just said. Simple way. Now go back and read it for the more expounded version. So then how do we fight then? 
Well, a lot of people have said about, you know, the different things with binding and loosing and casting things out and whatnot. That's not really what we see in the Bible. I'm going to show you examples of the Bible. Most of the time when people talk about binding and, and casting out, they don't actually point to a passage, passage of Scripture. They just simply say, this is how it is. And it's like, okay, well, show me that prayer in the Bible, and it doesn't exist. So then that brings up the question, so what is that prayer? Another example um, is, is generational curses, which people have gotten way out of hand with. Um, you know, it says in uh, Exodus, probably around chapter 20, he says, for the people who are doing these things, I'm going to remember it against the fourth and even the fifth, uh, even the third or fourth and or fourth and fifth, I don't remember which, generation. But to the ones who are righteous, I'm going to remember it to the thousand. Now, those aren't literal numbers. A household was commonly three to five generations. So it, what God is saying is that when you partake of witchcraft, your whole family is going to suffer for it. Your kids, your grandkids, nothing good is going to come from it. But if you're righteous, now to the thousandth generation doesn't mean literally one thousand generations. It means an, an everlasting covenant. I will remember what you did for those who came after you. For a long time, I'm going to remember this. It's not like God's actually taking off the mark. 999, 1,000. <laughs> you know, not like that. So, uh, so how do we fight against in the spiritual warfare? Let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Persevering in Bible-based prayer, lifestyle, and thought patterns. If Ephesians shows us the model right here. Tells us about how, how we're supposed to stand firm in these things. And it says, and take the helmet of salvation on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. This is how we fight through prayer. Prayer is our weapon. Yes. That's a pretty powerful statement. Seems how most of us are like, ah, I forgot to pray again today. I mean, I know I'm not the only one here. Don't look at me like that, guys. You're making me feel bad. At least pretend like you forget to pray every once in a while. Come on! <laughs> so by persevering by, through Bible-based prayer, through godly lifestyle, and through righteous thought patterns. You know, if you're letting something in your mind as a, as a thought pattern, it's going to be destructive. You know, uh, for instance, there's a lot of people I know going through depression. A lot of them opened up to me when I was going, going through depression. And, you know, I still have days when I'm tempted to, to give in. But, you know, you got to keep getting up going and fighting, you know. You can't just... Give up, and really, that's the thing is, is a lot of people who struggle with depression and anxiety. When that, they wake up in the, in the in the morning and they just think this: I'm always going to struggle with this, so I'm not even going to fight today. But that's exactly what the enemy would have you believe. Just because you are going to have it doesn't mean you have to give up. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Because even if you struggle every single day, never once find freedom from that. Do all and then stand firm. So, the things we do, the things we think, and, and our prayer. Those are, those are definitely how we fight. So, where does it say against praying against strongholds? Nowhere. And never once says that in the Bible. And I'm going to show you the examples of what it does tell us to pray. And the next time, we're going to look specifically about what about the demonic realm? What about when Satan has a stronghold in your community? We're going to look at that next time, okay? But I want you to focus on this part now, and we'll deal with the next part next, next time. Um, we're going to look at some examples here. Uh, the first, you can turn with me, Luke chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Jesus is, in the, um, is in, the, in the wilderness. He's been fasting for 40 days. Have you ever gone without food for 40 days? Yeah. My brother Joey did. Let me tell you, A, he was one shell of a man. <laughs> I could, uh, we could all put, my sister could push him over and it wasn't that difficult. I mean, he was a shell of a man. Uh, but then, you know, he was just a little loopy, definitely a little loopy. And, uh, you know, after the fast, he still couldn't eat that much of that fast. <laughs> he had to slowly work himself back up to be able to eat some. I'm laughing because it was kind of funny to watch. <laughs> yeah, this little, he looked like, um, I don't know, he just, <laughs> you know, if you see ever seen those little mice, those really tiny mice? That's what he looked like. He's <laughs> it was really funny. But anyway, Luke chapter 4, 1 through 4. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during these, those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Woke up, right? <laughs> 
uh, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. There's Satan's, there's, there's the start of the spiritual warfare. This is when Satan whispers something into your head. You can either choose to believe it, or you can respond like this. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, where is that written at? Where is that, where is that written again? Anybody know? Deuteronomy. Who said that? Oh, so you didn't know. <laughs> I really thought you knew. But hey, that's good. Now we're talking about the Old Testament here, guys. You know those books that nobody reads because they're too whatever, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? It's found in there. Oh, whoa. Whoa, my bad. <laughs> So, uh, you know, and he keeps going through here, and he answers him every single time. He never once says, I cast you out. He never once says, I bind you. He never once says, be gone. He answers it with scripture. See, what we do is we get so distracted on trying to have these super spiritual prayers that we forget that we are God's child. Well, I'm speaking in authority. I cast you out, Satan. And Well, good luck with that. And enjoy when it comes back in just a few more minutes. And then the next day, and the next day, I'll just keep coming back. You can cast it out however much you want. But if you're not answering what Satan's whispering in your ears with scripture, you're never going to conquer it. That's just how it is. God gave us the truth of how to approach these things in spiritual warfare. The problem is, we've been so busy making things real mystical that we've overlooked what God told us to do. We need to get serious about the importance of the Bible. This is like bread. It's like an anointing... Uh, fragrance is it's, 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 a, it's a good sign. Have you ever walked in the house and your wife just cooking something amazing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, let me tell you. Okay, I'm getting off there. Oh, guys, okay. So Jesus combated temptation with scripture, not casting Satan out. Let's look at another good example Daniel, the, uh, the prophet. He's after Isaiah and Jeremiah. Yeah. Ezekiel and then Daniel. He's the last of the major prophets before the little ones. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. And this is what scripture says. I'm not pulling teachings out of thin air. I'm showing you what the Bible shows us about spiritual warfare. Okay? A lot of people have a lot of ideas about spiritual warfare. I'm showing you what the Bible says. If you choose to believe something else, that's your own thing. But you need to know what the Bible actually says. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. This is what it says. And behold, I'm sorry, I still hear pages turning all way. I'm not trying to get in a hurry. Sorry about that, guys. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. And behold, the hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Daniel has been in a time of intense, intense fasting. And uh, it's been 21 days, and he's just finally getting the answer. An angel personally comes to him and tells him this. And he said to me, O Daniel, man great in love, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understanding and humbling yourself before your God, your words have been heard from day one. Okay, that's great, God, but here we are 21 days later. Where have you been? It's too, you, how many times have you said this to God? It's too late, God. What, where were you? And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia was good. And he's not talking about a physical prince. He's talking about an angel. Okay. There was a spiritual warfare that was going on. Um, withstood me 21 days. And, in other words, we just got victory today. And that's why I'm here today, because we just won. And But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what has happened to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Was there satanic or, or demonic opposition to Daniel's prayer and fasting? Yes. yes. Did Daniel ever once have to cast a demon out? No. Ever once have to bind a demon? No. no. He had to keep say, seeking the face of God, and God's servants fought the battle. Understand the difference? We are not the powerful one. God is the powerful one. We need to stop putting so much focus on us being super powerful. That's new age nonsense. That the power comes from within. Okay? Remember, we were, we were nothing. God adopted us as heirs. Now we are co-heirs with Christ because we've been made co-heirs with Christ. 
not because of anything we did. Do you understand the difference there? The power there. So, so far, all that we've seen that wins against spiritual warfare is God's word and prayer to God. Not prayer against something else or to, you see what I mean? Um, so then, okay, let's look at some more examples here. Um, so he was humbling, Daniel was humbling himself before God. Never a good idea to go to, to go to God telling him how much he owes you and how much you know and how much he deserves to give you what you're asking. Humble yourself, honestly. The only time things are addressed and casted out in scripture is not sickness, is not finances, is not depression, death, or attacks from Satan. The only time in the scriptures that something is casted out when it's a demonic possession and only when it's at the right time. You know, there are many people demon-possessed in Jesus' day. He didn't cast all the demons out. Well, why not? Only at his timing. Sometimes people have a demon and they don't want the demon gone. Sometimes they want the effects of the demon being gone, but they don't actually want to give their life over to God. And the Bible, Jesus even says this, if the demon were to leave, they would come back way stronger than they did the first time and with more demons, and they would have been in a worse state than they were originally. So don't do that. And then Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they say, we tried to cast this demon out, and he would not come out. How come you were able to, and we weren't? We were, you, gave, you gave us your same power. And he says, this one only comes out with prayer. Okay? So let's keep things in perspective. Okay, so we don't have to cast demons out of our finances. We need to start being smarter with our finances, realizing that Satan seeks to entrap us through our poor finances. We don't have to cast demons out of this, that, and the other thing. We need to pray for healing. We need to believe that God still heals people. We need to pray that pray for, for those of us who are in depression, we need to pray through. Even if we never find the, the, the victory in that battle, we still need to pray through. Michael, you are prayed through and you did not help. When you actually do it with your heart, yes. If you're doing it just for show, no. So uh, sometimes we say prayers like this, God, I pray that you would cast out. Well, that's the exact same prayer you're just putting on God. Instead of I cast out, you're, you're putting on God to cast it out. Which, by the way, the, the model for casting a demon out is that you cast it out in the name of Jesus, which means under the power and authority of Jesus. Okay? It is not I command you, or God, how would you say that? Um, God, I pray that you would cast it out. You, you don't pray like that. The, all the models and acts where the apostles were casting out demons and the gospels and all that, they said, I cast you out, okay? That is the model. So don't get carried away. In fact, the Acts shows us a, a situation where people tried to do that. Uh, I pray by Paul's God or whatever that you would, you know, come out. And that didn't go so well for them. So um, another thing we say is, I bind Satan. Well, that's nice. What are you binding him with? Fishing wire? <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't. The prayer doesn't really make sense. But what we need to do is we need to seek God's face and answer those little things that Satan puts on our heads with Scripture and with prayer. Okay, we need to be a people on our knees if we want to be people who are walking in victory. That's just how it's going to have to work. Or we can try and try and persuade ourselves that the, the demonic realm isn't real. Where there's no threat from it. We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't need all that. Go ahead and try to convince yourself of that, but it's never going to work. God gave us his Holy Spirit because he knew that we would need it. So, another thing we say is, I command. Well, I'm glad that you feel so confident that you have such amazing power that everything can quake before you. But remember that you're dealing with the demonic realm. And the demonic realm is powerful. The only reason we can overcome it is because Satan, I'm sorry, is because Jesus is greater than the one who's in the world. That's the reason why we have victory. Okay, so let's keep things in perspective here. We are not the masters. We serve the master. We are the slave of the master. I think that people nowadays have a bad view of that because, you know, slavery is bad. But in this context, actually, no, it's actually pretty good. We're, we're under God's protection. He's our master. He's our protector. So, um, so how do we pray? Scripture shows us. John 17, I'm not going to turn there, but you can. Jesus prays for an entire chapter. And never once does he cast Satan out of anything. He seeks God's face. God seeking God, how does that work? Whole nother conversation. <laughs> Whole nother conversation. But read through John chapter 17 and watch how Jesus prayed for it, prayed for the situation, okay? 
Um, so then, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, where the, the famous Lord's Prayer, where the apostles go to Jesus, how do we pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Pastor talked about it this morning. Nowhere in there is, it, is, it, is anything about casting Satan out. And deliver us from the, from the evil one, it says. God, deliver me. God, save me. Not casting anything out. Now, some of your translations are going to say in there, and deliver us from evil. The way that the Greek adjectives work, sometimes it's not a direct uh, word, but it's an implied meaning. The way that that adjective functions in that sentence, it's implying the evil person or the evil one. In other words, Satan. Um, so if you have a Bible translation that says, and deliver us from evil, it's not what he's talking about at all. Um, so, going on. Um, so that prayer is talking about God's will and God's purposes. Once again, nothing about nothing about Satan like that, right? James talks about um, overcoming Satan. How does he say to do that? Resist the devil and you will flee from him. Not Try cast the devil out. Draw nigh to God first. Right, right. Oh yeah, and I'm sorry. Yes, there's a whole bunch of uh, read through James if you want the whole story. I was giving the summated version. Uh, you know, it doesn't say cast the devil out and he will flee from you. It says resist and he will flee from you. You see what I mean? There, there's a difference there. Okay. So then we look at uh, Luke chapter 22. And I'm showing you nothing but examples of the Bible teaching us how to pray. And not one of them is some super spiritualized version. Okay? We, need to, we need to seek the Bible's answers more than we seek, what is it called, pop culture Christianity's answers? You know, as pastors, we're actually talking about this. In this we are, are we staff or board? We're staff. staff. We were talking about it in a staff meeting about how there's a lot of, of, of grow your church quick schemes out there. And as a pastor, you have to have the discernment to realize what things God actually wants you to do and what things he doesn't want you to do. You know what I mean? Did you know that we lose some people because the Holy Spirit moves in the church? As leaders, we have to be okay with that because it's not our church. It's God's church, and God wanted his people to have the Holy Spirit. So we have to make way for what God wanted. See what I mean? That's uncomfortable for us. Do you like? Do you think I like stand? I, I like standing up on stage with just awkward silence. I don't know of anybody who says, "Hey, yeah, I'll go up there and stand in front of people and do absolutely nothing for minute upon minute until God gives us a minute." I don't know of anybody who would do that. It's uncomfortable. Very. <laughs> so you know, the, the, and uh, it, it's inconvenient. The Holy Spirit inconveniences your life, and you have to be okay with that. He told Philip, you know, hey. Go out here to the middle of nowhere. And there's some guy, a eunuch, riding riding on a riding on a chariot. Go wait out there for him, and then and then in, in, to just whatever plans you had, forget about them, and explain the Bible to him. See what I mean? I bet Philip had better things to than go and teach the word to one person. I'm sure, one single person. It was way out there too. It wasn't like he was just, oh, I'm already there, just right around the corner. You, you know what I mean? I think that needs to be needs to be pointed out there. The whole the work of the Holy Spirit is going to inconvenience us, but it's going to touch people's lives. Do you think Do you think that is that eunuch cared that Philip went, went out there to tell him the word? I think he cared. Um, so, Luke twenty two thirty one. I forgot to finish trying that. Twenty two thirty one. This is what it says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, but I cast him out. Nope. That he might sit you like wheat. But then I cast him out? No. But I have prayed for you. That your faith may not fail. And when you have turned, again, strengthen your brothers. Well, if there was ever a situation where you have to cast something out, I think that would be the situation that called for it. But Jesus himself didn't even do that. Well, so that kind of brings up a whole different thing. Do you know, for a long time, I prayed something along the lines of this. You know the Jehovah's Witnesses right there. So I said, Lord, that you would bring judgment on them, and that you would basically pray curses on them. No. Is that what the Bible says to do? No. No, I, I don't think that's what it says to do. Pretty sure it says, pray for your enemies and bless those who curse you. I'm pretty sure it says about praying that God would set people free. Since Jesus came to set free the captive, not to make our religion better in our own eyes. See what I mean? But I really don't like them, God. Well, that's the first sign that you're praying something right, that God doesn't hate the same person you hate. Mm -hmm. 
Didn't Pastor talk about this only about a billion times? In fact, he says something along the lines of this, exactly this. When God hates the same people that you hate. Because God doesn't hate people. <laughs> See what I mean? And so we need to get our eyes back on what our goal is here as a church. So he didn't pray against Satan, he prayed for Peter. What if you do if someone's if if someone is, is being oppressed by Satan? You pray for them. Just like Jesus did here. Pray for them. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen my brother or my sister. I pray that you would you you give them the courage and, and the strength to keep going. I pray that you give them the thirst for your word. I pray them, I pray that you always would empower them for the word that you have ahead. I pray that you would that you would protect them divinely and you would keep them safe in these in these troubling troubling situations that they're going through. You don't have to do anything about this. Satan is an afterthought. God is the story. Okay? See, because of some different cults that have been going on, Satan has been shown as Jesus' brother, or about like a yin-yang, he's the opposite opposing force of Jesus. But the truth is, Jesus is God. Satan is no more than an angel who rebelled. A messenger. You know what angel means? From the Greek, angelos, messenger. That simple. It's a messenger of God. That's all Satan is. See what I mean? So does the demonic realm have power? Yes, absolutely. Greater power than we have in and of ourselves. However, Jesus is all powerful. And they're not, it's not, this is this is God's arch enemy. No, it's just that guy over there. You know what I mean? It's it's like uh, when you get married and uh, and your spouse has dated someone in the past that they don't even think about. They completely they don't even care, like they're in the past. And then you bring it up and they're like, who cares? It's like that. Satan's like, who cares? You know, it, it, God's, God's the main story here. Um, so, 1 Corinthians and James, they both talk about this. Praying with the right heart. Your battle is already lost if it is lost in the heart. Which is why it's so important that you keep your heart safe. Protect your heart. Protect it. God gave it to you. Protect it. Because that's how Satan gets his foot in. Somebody does you wrong, the bitterness creeps up. You will let things like Ouija boards in your house, demonic movies, tarot cards. Do you know that three fourths of the American population is involved in that stuff? Three fourths of the American. We're talking about people who call themselves Christian, and they allow these things in their household and even participate in them. I've talked to many Christians who say something along the lines of this Ouija boards are harmless. <laughs> No. Well, okay, I guess I'm the one out of the loop on that one. So we're going to talk about that kind of stuff in, in the second part of this. Um, and we're going to look at their history, where they came from, how they affect us as Christians, what the Bible actually says. Like this, looking at what the Bible says. Because if you don't know what the Bible says, it doesn't matter what other fields of opinions are. Um, but then 1 Corinthians also brings up something else that I want to bring about. Not every time that you're tempted is it Satan. Sometimes Satan tempts you because there's an open door there already. Like, for instance, you have wandering eyes. So then Satan just pushes things by your way, like pornography. Pushes things by your way, like an adulterous person. See what I mean? Because you, you still struggle with your flesh. Jesus has saved you, yes, and the Holy Spirit is regenerating you and everything. We're not, we're not even talking about that. But there is still a daily fight. Paul put it like this. The very things I don't want to do, I end up doing. I can't explain it. I hate that I'm doing it, but I'm still doing it. It drives me insane, guys. You know what I mean? And, 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 and that's just how it is. You know, we're struggling between we have a good heart and we have a bad heart. And there's this ongoing fight about, well, if we're saved, shouldn't we not have this anymore? And yet we still have it. So, um, where is that with me? So then we can pray things like this. Lord, protect us and guide our feet. Move in the heart of our community. Forgive us, Lord. Set our eyes on your ways. Thank you for your blessings. Look at the prayers that East, uh, are recorded in either Ezra or Nehemiah, for your which. Look at the prayers of uh, Daniel that are recorded. Look at the prayers of the prophets that are recorded. So, I mean, and you'll start to see this dependence on God. Like, I think it was, yeah, the pastor was talking about, um, I believe it was the prophet uh, Habakkuk, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong here, please, because I know you know this one almost by heart. Where he's praying to the Lord, and he goes on this thing, and then he says, I'm waiting here for you to sh for you to correct me, because I know I'm wrong here. So just, is that Habakkuk? Yeah, Habakkuk. At the end of the book, he goes on this long, drawn-out prayer, and he says, and I'm just waiting here for you to gently, because I know I'm, I know I'm wrong here. 
So show me how I'm wrong. Please speak to me on this. This is really bothering me. These people are wicked people. How could you use them? Speak to me, God. I'm not, I'm not getting this. And then God answers him at the end of the book. So read through there and you'll kind of see that. And Psalms. Psalms is another book that's filled with prayers of the saints. And the great thing about Psalms is that it oftentimes records people's false motives and people's wrong ideas. One Psalm says this. Oh, that somebody would take their children and dash them upon the rocks. Well, that's a bitter spirit, I would say. Or is he saying that we should pray like that? No. He's saying that when we have these kinds of frustrations, we should take it to the Lord because he already knows it's in our heart. We try and pretend to God like we're something real great. God, I have everything figured out. I never have bad thoughts. I'm certainly not praying bad things. You know, well, why lie to God if he already knows what's up? I mean, come on. So... So attacks from the enemy. What are some common attacks from the enemy? Number one, distractions and services. Where somebody's doing something in the service and, and, and you just get you, you allow it to steal your attention. You know what I mean? We're in a time of worshiping, waiting for our words from the Lord. And instead of seeking after the Lord, you just allow yourself to be tempted. That's that's Satan. Why? Because he doesn't want you worshiping God. That's exactly what, what caused him to fall out from heaven in the first place. He wanted the, the glory that God was getting. That's exactly the... And hey, interesting thought. Did you know that it never says that Satan was the most beautiful? It just says that he was beautiful. Just interesting. Another thing that our culture has thrown out there. Um, or when you don't feel like going to church. Buddy, this one hits me. I know the associate pastor should always feel like being in the... Did you know that sometimes I don't like dealing with people? Sometimes I just want to hide from people. I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. Sometimes I think, ah, not them. I was joking with Becky, just joking. And I said that if I ever, ever am a pastor, I think I'm going to start my Sunday mornings with, good morning, turkeys. <laughs> this is a joke, guys. Just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, sometimes you get mad at people. Sometimes, if you're anything like me, I'm a bit of an introvert. I really don't like hanging out anyways, you know. When I'm in a conversation, my thought is, in, is either on two things. What, what, after this person's done with what they're saying, what am I going to say? How am I going to keep this conversation going? Or, the same thing that I think, how can I get out of this conversation quicker so that I, they don't know that I don't have anything else to say? Uh, yeah, well, I got to go. See what I mean? And it, it's, a, it's a struggle every day, guys. I'm the complete opposite of my father. He, he doesn't care about the specifics. I only care about the specifics. He can talk to anybody, anywhere. I can talk to somebody, maybe if I worked up the courage for a couple hours. You see, we're complete polar opposites. <laughs> and uh, anyways, um, so uh, and remember that when you're worshiping God, that Satan doesn't want you to have that. When you do something like stop drinking, stop doing drugs, stop smoking, you're going to have those days that you just don't feel like doing it. When you start exercising, you're going to have those days that you just don't feel like, because God, Satan doesn't want you to be healthy. He doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be distracted, or if you are on your way to happiness, he'll bring by distractions. These are things that convince us that we are happy in life. A good job, money, a car, and they convince us that we genuinely are happy. But the truth is, we're just as unhappy as we were before, we were just distracted. Yeah. We're just distracted. It's like putting on the fire, like Satan almost conspires, so you have to put them out, you know, instead of worshiping Yeah. Yeah, and as a pastor, that's something that happens all the time. You're, you're doing your thing, things are going good in the church, and then, without fail, somebody has more problems. And then they all have problems at the same time. Then everybody goes to you with their problems, and, and then you're like, oh man, I'm over swamped. So then you get this idea of the pastor. Well, i got to answer everybody's problems. Forgetting that God's the one who answers the problems. And then you get distracted, and you forget to start, you forget to keep praying. You know how frustrating that is as a pastor? Because then you're depleted, so then you go to the next Sunday service and you're not preaching with power because you don't have any power because you spent it all on people throughout the week. That's frustrating! That's very frustrating! <laughs> you want to be able to do the job well, you want to be able to do everything to reach everybody, but you just can't. You're limited, and that is frustrating. Anyways, um, so that, another distraction, depression that started when you started doing God's work. Well, I never struggled with this before. When did it start? Well, when I start, when I stopped uh, playing video games twenty four seven. When I stopped drinking all the time. When I stopped. Do you think that there could be any kind of a connection there? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is. Well, I, you know, I was talking to one person, and they went after their. I don't know how long it is. I've never been a, a drug addict. I've never been an alcoholic. 
Um, but after their detox, however long that was, uh, they were still struggling with depression. And why am I still struggling with that? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you need to see a counselor. Maybe you need to be spending time in the Word. Maybe you need to be praying. Maybe you need, I don't know, man. There could be a lot of different things. Uh, you know, maybe you did damage. I know a lot of people who, who there's permanent damage done from the drugs. And, you know, I'm not trying to belittle anybody, but, you know, hey, see a doctor. It's all right. It's all right. You know, honestly. I, nobody here is going to condemn you for seeing a doctor. Totally okay. So remember that. Um, problems with others. It just so happens that after I was seeking God and after the good things were happening, I just, th this person just came and they irritate me. Yeah, because Satan is bringing something by to get under your skin. But here's the good news. In all these things, God works these things to the good. So while Satan is doing everything to turn everything to evil and destruction, God's trying to do everything to bring about victory. Bring about his purposes. And guess which one's going to win? God. God. Guess which one seems like it takes a little bit longer to win? God. Sometimes when we're seeking after God, it's going to yeah. take a little while. Do you know that it took me about... Three weeks to wipe out them mice. Took out, took some time. That's kind of how it is with when you become a new pastor at church and working out the heresies that have been going on. When, uh, when you're, 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 when you have kids that go to public school and they bring home all kinds of foolishness and you have to weed it out. You can't, you can't just like everything fix it all in one day. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some time. You know what I mean? Anyways. Um, and it's the same with problems with others, you know, but I just can't forgive them. Well, keep trying. Well, I have been trying, so keep trying. But I have been trying, so keep trying. It's all right. You've got the rest of your life to work on this. Don't get in a rush. Calm down. Slow down. God is still in control. Honestly, we get, the problem is our, our, our reach oftentimes extends our grasp. Yeah, I just, go ahead. Can you go back just a little bit here talking about how... Um, Sin or enmity. Which which part? Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, you're limited in the sense of you cannot find power within yourself. As people, we have to rest. As people, we have to be uh, continually filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. As people, we have to need the Sabbath day to rest. Right, right. Rather, and, and as people, you know, we have to remember that. Do you know that sometimes when the Holy Spirit is using you, you kind of get full of yourself? Do you know that sometimes televangelists didn't start out crooked? Did you know that? Do you know that sometimes pastors who commit adultery, they weren't always wrong in their hearts? Sometimes things just happen, they distract us, Satan's little schemes, and they get us off course. And so then we start getting into this thing, and we pray prayers like this, I command this to happen. Normal's having sickness, I command that the sickness would leave. That's not what God told us to do. He said, pray for them. Lord, I pray that you would heal this person. That's what he told us to do. Nothing about casting things out. So in our power, we're not limited. We're limited. We can't just cast things out of things because, well, there's nothing to cast out. It's a sickness, not a demon. But then second off, because we have to depend on God. Even, even in the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says the gifts of healings. Meaning that there's different kinds of gifts given at different times. Exactly. See what I mean? In other words, you can't say, I have the gift of healing. I'm super spiritual. I heal people. I'm a healer. God is healing the people. He is simply using you. You are a tool, right? You're his base. He gets to use you as he wills. God is using us. Right. 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 And that's the idea of praying in the name of Jesus. It's not this cute catchphrase that you just tag at the end of a prayer. God, I pray that you give me a Corvette because I want one in the name of Jesus. It's saying, I am praying in the power and authority of Jesus according to what he desires. That's what in the name of Jesus means. Lord, I pray that you would heal my brother who is struggling with the sickness in the name and the power of Jesus. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Because I know that God desires I have to heal him. Because that's what his word says that he desires to do. However, sometimes God, in his infinite wisdom, decides to heal people later through the power process of death. Sometimes he decides to heal people gradually, and sometimes he decides to heal people instantly. I am not the master, so I don't get to figure out why. I am the servant. I pray for people. See the difference? Uh, I, exactly what he just said, what Joby just said. As long as we're, as we're submitted to him, doing his will, then we're not limited in power. See the difference there? It's a big, big difference. But people who get real caught up in the Word of Faith movement, 
blur the lines. If I say it and proclaim it, it'll happen. It's just going to happen because I said it. Well, that's not how it works, though. When, 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 John, when John talks about whatever we pray, God will answer, he doesn't literally mean every single thing that we pray. I pray that uh, there be no world hunger and uh, every child would be adopted. And uh, I pray that I'd have all the money in the world. I pray that, that we'd have nothing but righteous presidents until the end of the world. See what I mean? Like, that's not God's purposes. We're not praying with God's purposes here. Lord, I pray that you would raise up your church to provide for those who don't have food. God, I pray that you would, see what I mean? God wants us to be his hands and feet. Oh, God, touch these kids over here. I'm not going to do anything now whatsoever. But hey, you do something. See what I mean? <coughs> Prayer is a starting and stopping point. But in the middle of that starting and stopping point is the part where God tells us to do something we do it. You understand the difference? We lean on God, we depend on God, everything is done for God's glory. But at the end of the day, when God says jump, we jump. See what I mean? We've, we've, we've kind of confused ourselves with this whole free will thing. I don't like the idea of being God's slave. So I get to do whatever I want whenever I want. So as a result, we enslave ourselves to sin. And we repeat the same life patterns, getting drunk every weekend, wasting all of our money every, every month. We don't have any money set aside in our savings account. We don't have any any, any uh, close friends that actually care for us past the the uh, the drugs that we provide for them. Oh, this guy's my homeboy as long as I got pot. And as soon as I'm out of pot, well, you don't see him around, do you? A true friend would be someone who says, "This is tearing up your body. This is destroying your body. You definitely need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, get on rehab, do something." This is destroying your body. See what I mean? So, um, bad attitude surface. That's not just coincidence, guys. We need to realize these for things for what they are. As leaders, as parents, as as children, as 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 church members, we need to remember that when these things come up, they're not just random happenstance. They're any opportunity that Satan is looking for to stick something in there. So he's just waiting to tear you down, looking for the opportunity, just looking for it. See, I thought of a joke just then, but I didn't say it. That's that's the sermon right there. Uh, <laughs> so we've allowed our focus to be on pleasure and happiness. God wants us to be happy, doesn't he? That's not task number one. We've allowed the, the, the focus to be on feelings. This world is governed and dictated by feelings. Everything in our culture is based on feelings. Which is actually kind of funny because that is a very dominant idea in the cult. Is the idea that relative thought, if I, if it's true for me, that's fine. It doesn't have to be true for you. There's no absolute truth, you know. Um, what what determines our sexuality? My feelings. What determines um, my what job I should get? Well, get a job that'll make you happy. No job's ever going to make you happy. Jobs weren't meant to make you happy. God gave them as punishment. <laughs> We're supposed to find our happiness in God. We're supposed to find our happiness in that. See what I mean? So as a result, we're telling our kids it's nonsense. Go out and get and go to college because if you go to college, you'll get hired. And eh, wrong. And then get a degree that's something you're interested in doing. No, find where a job is that you can do that's moral and do that. <laughs> we need to stop telling our kids to, to keep chasing their dreams. We're, we're creating a, a, a whole generation of people that are that are chasing something that doesn't exist. I'm getting a master's degree in puppeteering, and I'm going to get billions for it. No, you aren't. You're going to live in your mom's garage for the rest of your life. <laughs> this is just not a good idea. You have a degree in puppeteering? Well, I'm just saying that if we do do it, and we do it you know, for Christ's sake. You know, right. right. So if we do that, we can, uh, we can head out a certain direction. And yeah. If God decrees we go that way, it's good. No, yeah, and I absolutely, absolutely agree with that. But something Bill Gothard said that caught my attention when I was a kid. Is uh, there's this there's this kid that wants to go and be a pastor, so he wants to go and get a degree for for pastoring, like a, a Bible degree. And his father had a little bit better of advice. Why don't you get a get a degree like for the secular world, and then go on to pastor, and that way you have something as a fallback. And as the father had a very good point. Did you know that sometimes as a pastor you have to work a second job? It's nice to be able to get hired at that second job. It, it's nice to get hired for that second job. See what I mean? And you don't have to go to college, you can go to trade school, sometimes you don't even need to go to school. You know, I'm not trying to say you have to do one thing or another. 
but you know, we need to, like, like uh, Mike was saying, we need to be, be open to the way that when God has, has a leaning, be wise, but, but listen to God. Absolutely. Um, so we've allowed our, 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 our focus to be on pleasure, happiness, feelings, and the cares of this world. Now in Mark 4.19, he says this, that, there, there, that Jesus went out and was planting these seeds, right? Or the, the farmer, technically. The farmer's planting these seeds, and it says that one was starting to grow, but that it was choked out by the cares of the world. Did you know that he's not just talking about people who get saved? He's talking about Christians too. The cares that come up and choke us out. Destroy some people. What? Destroy some people. Yes, destroy some people. Those Christians who get uh, terrible things, okay? I'm not trying to downplay this, but Christians who get cancer. It's hard to trust in God when you know you're on a clock. It's hard to do that. I'm not denying that at all. I genuinely thought I was going to die back in 2012. 12, 12. I genuinely thought I was going to, I didn't think I was going to make it out of the hospital. So, I mean, I know how scary it is to live on, on what you think is a time limit. And I'm not saying God doesn't know. But, you know, it, it, it's difficult to do that. But the cares of the world, they come up and they creep up. They creep up very, 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 very sly-like. They're like ninjas in our minds, you know. And they, you know, get this, they'll even be good things. Okay, they'll even be good things that come up, guys. Good things that come and distract us. Like, as a, do you know as a pastor, you guys are not a distraction. You are our job. It's what we're here for. Like, God entrusted you to us we have an awesome responsibility and should we do something to, to tarnish that god holds us accountable that's a very scary thing okay? very scary thing pastors aren't just or at least they shouldn't be just you know this random guy they should be called by people absolutely especially considering the fact that james tells us that leaders are judged all the harsher by god and jesus talked about it in great length so i don't really want to but you know just we need to keep things in perspective here. Um, but taking care of, of people sometimes becomes a distraction from other things. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes, as a, let me reword that. Sometimes as a pastor, you have to take care of things. It may not be pleasurable to take care of, but you have to take care of them either way. But unfortunately, those things can oftentimes get our attention off of God and too focused onto the problem, where we're no longer unavailable to seek God or to help other people. That makes sense, and it's the same thing for parents too. Your job is stressful. Your your finances are stressful. You take care of your kids. You you know you're at work, and this person's just a pain in the butt. They never do their job right, so you take it out on someone else. So I mean, it, it, things come by like that that seem to distract us. What do you see though? I was just like to ask when they the apostle said we should be praying and seeking the Lord. You will appoint someone to take care of the food or right, right. whatever. And what she's talking about is in Acts when uh, they were just stretched too thin and uh, then there was a problem that came up with the widows and basically the elders said, look, we just honestly, we don't have time for this. Let's appoint some of the people to take care of this so that we can keep on doing this. And that, that's kind of what I was, what I was um, saying, but yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So watch out for the cares of the world. Cares of the world can be anything, guys. And oftentimes when we get our eyes focused on that, we, we start going to things like divorce and that kind of stuff. We start believing that these things are going to bring us happiness. You know, Divorce doesn't bring you happiness. Um, it brings a temporary distraction from the problem, and it brings separation from the problem. Um, most of the people I know who have gotten uh, divorced, it's been something that's, that's destroyed their household, destroyed their life. Um, you know, the, the relationship with the kids is, is hurt. I mean, everything. Divorce is not a good thing. It's kind of a last resort. It's the last thing you have to do. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't really want to talk about that. It's kind of off topic. But what my point is, is the cares of the world, the things that distract us. You know, our financial issues, our work issues, that, those kinds of things. Um, but yeah. So in conclusion, there's some things I want to talk about here. First, there is a battle and we are, we are in it. doesn't matter if you don't want to be in it, you're still in it. Okay? Number two, you will occasionally pray the wrong thing or with the wrong heart. That's just something that's going to happen. You know, people say, well, what if I pray the wrong thing? You will eventually. Just keep going. Pastors talked about this recently, so I'm not going to anymore. Uh, third thing, binding and casting won't work, nor will avoiding the fight. People go to two extremes, trying to bind and cast everything, or they just try to avoid the, avoid the fight. You can't do either. None of the things is going to bring a lasting victory. You have to see God's face. 
And he will change lives. He will change situations. He will bring hope and joy and peace. And he will set captives free because that's what he does. Fourth thing, living for God is an attack on Satan, as is prayer and aligning our spirits with Scripture. When we live God's way, that is spiritual warfare. That's how we break down strongholds. I'm going to talk about more about that next time. But our prayer life, the things that we think and the things that we do, these things are spiritual warfare. Never, ever, ever think that that thought that entered your mind was just a fluke thing that Satan doesn't want to use. Satan can't read your thoughts, but he can read your expressions and your acts. And only God knows the heart. Satan does not. Read your Susan. Yes. Yes. Yes, he can. And through observation, he can, he can figure out where those things in our, in, to, to hit his mind. Um, okay, so living for God is an attack on Satan. We need the Word of God, which is the Holy Spirit's work. It's the same. The, the Bible was produced how? The power of the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? So it is, it is that same thing. And then the last thing, the Bible isn't all we need. And this is a, a heresy that's been going on in the church for a long time. The Bible is all we need. No, it's not. The Bible itself says no, it's not. We need fellowship of the saints. We need each other. Absolutely. We need, we need absolute de dependence prayer. We need prayer. It's not a, oh, you should pray if you have to. You need it. Your spirit needs it. Your spirit is constantly being polluted by the world and Satan, and it needs God's interaction. Uh, we need, absolutely, we need the gifts of the Spirit. It's not going to be a good thing to have. We, the church needs that. We have to go out into a dark world. How can you if you don't have the light with you? Um, and we need worship. You need to worship God. You need to. These are things that your spirit needs. So we're going to talk about next time, um, we're going to talk about Ouija boards, Satanism, mysticism, blasphemy, disrespecting parents, that kind of stuff, and talking about the more demonic realm of the spiritual warfare. This is just the introductory idea for the spiritual warfare. Um, and that stuff is on a different level of spiritual warfare. Okay? There's, there's regular sins that you do. Then there's intentional sins. This is a hardening of your heart, which leads you to other things. But then, below that is this level of sin, which is a very, very, very bad place to be in. And that's the demonic. That's stuff like di uh, disrespecting authority. That's the rebellion of the heart. That's in that bottom rung. Ouija boards. That's in that bottom rung. First Samuel says that rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft, which means it's similar. It's the same category there. Rebellion, disrespecting your authority, that's the same as Ouija boards. What? That means you need to stop thinking those stupid things you're thinking about your parents who wronged you when you were kids. You need to stop thinking about all those different, you know, all those different destructive ideas. And I'm not going to go down the list because I'm going to start making people mad. But for instance, this is one that hopefully won't make people mad. President Trump is our is our president. I didn't say you have to like him. He needs our prayer, and our country needs our prayer. Doesn't have anything to do with liking him. Has to do with God commanding us to pray for those in authority. Okay. We need to pray for our country. That's something that we need. Okay? And our country needs it too. But anyways, we'll talk about that next time. Uh, but I do want you to be aware of that is on the same level. Um, and then uh, some will instantly discredit, discredit what I've said tonight because you have chosen what to believe. Even past scripture's authority. And you know, I, I understand that, that, that this, this is a hard, hard for a lot of people. Some people, they don't want to change because they genuinely believe that binding and casting has power. Even though it's not warranted anywhere in Scripture, other people will, will fail to believe the the importance of spiritual warfare because they'd rather just live their life blind to it. And I understand both views, really. I do. But then there's going to be other people who intend to listen, but the enemy will blindside you, and you will forget that there is a battle. I want you to, if you don't agree with me either way, to just prayerfully consider what, I, what I've said. And either way, stay in the Word and stay in prayer. And stay in a church. It doesn't have to be this one. Stay in a church. okay? Where they teach that there is salvation through Jesus Christ alone, not through works, not by joining a church or a club, but by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Because your works will never be good enough. To go to a church where they, where they teach that God is active and living and sharper than any two double edged sword. Okay? So, uh, any questions before I stop? I, I, I think that was pretty long already. I mean,
we could go longer if you really want, if you're bored and don't have any problems with people. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, I'm stopping for real. Okay. Can you close?